If our own culture doesn't support the fact that mental health is a problem, then what's the point? And it took me getting to a really, really, really bad place before I realised, wait, this is not good, this is not normal, this is dangerous. It's not spoken about in my family, it's not spoken about in our communities. When we look at how South Asian people, especially the older generation, talk about their psychological struggles, they talk about the body. They never talk about this. Ladies and gentlemen, I go by the name of Hyphen. Two fingers up, I said peace. One finger down, I said please. Point to the place where I need to be. My name is Ardish. Um, though my stage name is Hyphen. Do it for the art, not to sell my dream. I point to the place where I need to be. The mental health thing for me is what everything always comes back to. Basically, every person I've ever met has obstacles in the way of their choices that would make them happy. British Asians have a lot of those obstacles. For example, people who are really artsy, but they have to go into finance or medicine or accounting or law or whatever. I had a story which a lot of British Asians are probably quite familiar with until the age of about my mid-twenties. I worked quite hard at school. I went to university to study philosophy and economics. I worked in finance for a few years and Around that time, when I just started in finance, I had a friend who died by suicide, and a few years later, uh, or maybe a year or so later, I remember walking home from work. I was working in finance. I was, uh, I was, I was suicidal at the point. Uh, I remember sort of thinking, there's no point going on. I'm so desperately sad. Nothing can ever fix this. What's the point anymore? And it was at that point when I was like, this is the point I'm at. That's where I've gotten to. And this isn't, like, this isn't kind of healthy. This isn't good. Um, yeah, I think that was the moment where I was like, okay, you can't stop pretending this is a thing anymore. When I'd say psychology, the immediate thing would be, oh, buggle you know, crazy people. People would be a bit like, oh, okay. But what was interesting was that when they would get me on their own, so not in a crowd, they would say, I've got a cousin or an aunt or a relative who might need your help. So they would kind of do it on the quiet. They wouldn't want to say it in front of people that this is what's happening. People are frightened of mental illness because they don't know what causes it. The people who seek help because they feel that if they seek help, it will become known in the community and others will reject them, not talk to them. Nobody would marry into their family. That's my degree, University of Kent, 32 years ago now. When I'm going out, when I was in Canterbury, I was going out and everything, people were looking at me everywhere, you know, on the streets, everywhere, you know, talking about me, I think they were, yeah. yeah as I was diagnosed, uh, uh, schizo paranoid schizophrenia, they said, yeah. And more recently, OCD as well. Looking on the streets and and all the, all the other students as well um, in the university, they were looking at me as well and, you know, um, yeah, it was very um, scary experience, you see. I can't hold, I find it's a hold a suitable job. I haven't worked for, since 1995, that's when I last worked. Ever and you know, I've been taking medication for 32 years now, yeah, and it's not very well talked about in the Asian community, is it? In in the UK, is it? Um, schizophrenia, I don't, and depression, OCD, anxiety, and you know. Let's see if what Douglas has when he comes out for this round. This was about this was about the time that my illness started, yeah, and I think um. You know, when my time's been lost, it may, may have been due to me. 
It may have been due to me. Because I'm, I'm, I told you, I think the people everywhere around the world, people are talking about me. So my taste may have heard something about me, and then that may make you this. Because nobody in my life can really just come up, come up to you and say, you, you have a problem, I re realise that you have a problem, do you need help? Nobody has done that. Yeah. What I've seen as a Bangladeshi therapist since I've been working in the field has been really positive that I've had a lot of people reach out to me. So I think that that's something that is really helpful, that if you see someone who looks like you or speaks the same language as you talking about mental health straight away, it helps to break down some of that stigma that does exist in the community. I grew up in East London and my parents were quite traditional, both of them are Muslim. I think it was in year nine, I was obviously also hitting puberty at the time and I think that's when I started having like challenges around uh, just sort of like self-esteem, confidence and this overwhelming sense of like feeling quite sad and you know not really fitting in with my siblings too much and I always felt like an outsider. I don't remember how it started, but I just remember that I was in the bathroom one day and um, there was like one of my dad's like razors and I took the razor off and then there was, there was obviously I took the blade out. And I remember that night it was like, I just like cut my arms and it felt like, it just felt like this release and it sort of like became, and I didn't even know like self-harm was like a thing then. I didn't really know how to speak to my parents about it. And I think I brought it up once with one of my teachers at school and I just sort of mentioned it, that I was struggling. My teacher took me to the head teacher's office and um, I spoke to her about it and they referred me, I think I was in year 11 at the time, they referred me to a mental health specialist. All the therapists were white women or white men and it was just so difficult to explain to them that like when I told them, they were like, oh, so do you speak to your parents about this? They must know. And I'm like, no, they do not know about this. And it was really hard to explain that to them. There was a huge cultural barrier because it just, it's not spoken about in my family. It's not spoken about in our communities. I did my master's at Cambridge and um, I remember it was my second week there and um, the college's BAME officer, he, um, we were having a party and he came up to me and he was like, I was wearing an England shirt because I was watching the cricket, and um, the, he came up to me and he was like, oh, why is um, a Paki wearing an England shirt? And it was just like this, it was just a whole new element of like, wow, it's like, you know, Again, isolation and like, you know, being disconnected from the culture that you're so obviously part of, you've grown up here and then you get rejected by like, you know, people like people who believe it to be like only theirs and things like that. And I think my master's at Cambridge, that was a really, really difficult period and I really struggled with my identity and um, my depression and that so many different things can trigger it. Like I had no idea that having or like being racially abused at university would, would be something that would trigger my depression and anxiety. But of course it would be because it's, an, it's disgusting and it's also like a horrible thing for someone to have to go through. I think when, it, when I got to my final, final year of university, um, that's when I sort of decided for myself um, and it took a lot. It, it, it was, took a lot of strength and courage. But I was like, right, I need to make a change in my life. Like I can't. I've, as a young girl, like I've suffered with this so much that I need to. Something needs to change, and something needs to give. And I think that's when I actually started looking at. Um, there's like sort of like initiatives for um, therapists who are like therapists of colour who and, and people who would understand these problems a lot more. Um, so I, I did my research into that and found um, a South Asian woman um, and started speaking to her. Um, so she was my therapist and I started speaking to her and she actually, it was just like finally someone sort of like understands it. You tell someone to toughen up. What does that mean? You know, when you're mentally broken, you know, I get the intent, but you can't just toughen up. 
If someone turns up at a hospital with a broken arm, you can't just say, you know, to toughen up, or you can't use words to fix that. You have to intervene and try and you know, do something to, to, to aid that fracture getting better. It's the same thing. You, you think this is really easy. You, you don't think this is a big deal. Well, when I'm not here anymore, you'll understand. I used to stare at my son's photo and uh, Yeah, just stare at my son's photo and cry because um, I'd imagine him growing up without a dad. And um, even that wasn't enough to really deter me. I, it would, for me, it was just like a foregone conclusion. I'd just be like, I've decided I, don't, I can't deal with this anymore. It's not even that I don't want to, it's just like, you know, I don't have the power to deal with this anymore. And I used to try and lean on my son as my kind of defense mechanism. I remember the first time I opened up about this, it's like, oh, if I say this, I'm suddenly less of a man. And because we're so embedded with this concept of masculinity, the idea that we let that concept go is just quite devastating. I think a lot of the mental health, the way I've come at it is that like, I, realistically, my dad, my parents, they were going through so much and just had no way of processing it. And then when I started experiencing a lot of things, I've, I've kind of like reflected and I'm like, I was around people who had no language for processing it. And so now when I have tried to process these things, I've had to do a lot of work to kind of, like I, I've seen a therapist a lot, like I, I still struggle with expressing myself, which seems weird given it's like kind of my job. Um, and I think it is because, you know, I had South Asian parents who've through no fault of their own, they came from a context where this wasn't talked about, they've come to another country where they don't have as big a community. When I think about what our parents and our grandparents had to go through in order to settle here or anywhere across the world, they were in survival mode. They did whatever it took to survive. So that is to start from the beginning. Many of them came with very little. They had very little financial means. And for them, in order to become something here, they had to try and create some sort of safety. And this is physical safety, financial safety, at the expense of their psychological safety or their psychological health. So in order for them to survive, they pushed down any psychological trauma, depression, anxiety, all of that just gets pushed down. It comes out in other ways. But also, to add on top of that, there was no language then. We, we didn't grow up with the language. Even in our own mother tongue, Gujarati, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, we don't have the language that, translate, that translates directly to the language we use within the mental health system. I didn't know mental health was like actually a thing that you should consider when I was a kid. Obviously, I was never taught it. I was never like seeing it. Like the, the way my parents would have approached it would have been like, be a man kind of mindset but yeah college was like the first time I like fully discovered that I had depression because an incident happened I think towards the end of the uh my first year when I was 17 and I was really close with someone like really really close with someone and they had attempted suicide um and then like just proceeded to block me off completely um and then because of how much of an impact that had on me, I just felt like I don't, I, I felt worthless basically for the whole summer. And like, I just wanted to, I wanted to attempt myself actually. Like I, I wanted to, I've never told anyone that I've wanted to sort of just attempt doing it myself because I just thought I was like very, very worthless. I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't, I didn't save the person. And I was like, oh shit, like I've got to, yeah, I don't know, it was, it, was a, it was a mess. There's a huge onus on the NHS to provide adequate and appropriate provision for the community, 
But I also think as the community, we've always been a community that looks, likes to look after each other. And I think it's something that's really nice and unique and, and is a wonderful quality we share. And that's why I think it's like we, we can raise the issue that we can support our own mental health more by providing more within the community. And whether that's like safe spaces, having opportunities to talk about mental health, raising awareness, people also being good role models. It's really interesting when you see someone um, share their mental health conditions or, or concerns and you're like, wow, I didn't realize you were going through that. And it helps to dispel that kind of association of a label or someone with that condition is just like in the mental health institutions or hospitals and, and they have no hope when actually that's not at all true. Please start to get it in your heads now. Like, I think it's probably best to start considering that this is real. Mental health is a problem that needs to be solved. You just need to understand that this is the new way of thinking. Like, we are going forward, not backwards. We can't stick in the past and we can't let culture keep on doing our thing. If we're moving forward and the whole world is, you know, we've got Mental Health Awareness Day and stuff like that, I think they need to kind of just sort of re-educate themselves like that. And they can't wait till the last minute, you guys. Definitely ask for help sooner because the more you don't, the more it builds up inside you and that's just when it gets worse. So ask for help sooner and have like, <clears throat> you know, we live in, we're quite lucky that now the landscape is changing and there are, you know, there's um, organisations that have a collective of like black and Asian therapists that you can go to and um, there's sort of different forums or different like like places online that you can like speak about these things there's different like apps that you can have therapy through and you know a lot of it, it's like it can all be kept like confidential and things like that like there are so many different ways to navigate it that weren't necessarily there like five ten years ago so it's absolutely critical to talk about what you're feeling with your family, with your friends, with your peers, with your colleagues. And not be afraid to seek help from your general practitioner, from your community psychiatric nurse, from the pundits and the gyanis and the imams. And if they say you need to go and see a psychiatrist, there's absolutely no shame in doing so. What that will do is help you get back to a level of functioning which is good for you, for your friends, your family and the community as a whole. So if it's a family member, a friend um, who's struggling, um, I think the, one of the most important things you can do is just to listen to them, to give them space, to be patient um, and to take what they're saying as serious.